Welcome to the Sense Making in a Changing World podcast, where we explore the kind of thinking we need to navigate a positive way forward. I'm your host, Maura Gamble, permaculture educator and global ambassador, filmmaker, eco villager, food forester, mother, practivist, and all round lover of thinking, communicating, and acting regeneratively. For a long time, it's been clear to me that to shift trajectory to a thriving one planet way of life, we first need to shift our thinking. The way we perceive ourselves in relation to nature, self and community is the core. So this is true now more than ever. And even the way change is changing is changing. Unprecedented changes are happening all around us at a rapid pace. So how do we make sense of this? To know which way to turn, to know what action to focus on. So our efforts are worthwhile and nourishing and are working towards resilience, regeneration and reconnection. What better way to make sense than to join together with others in open, generative conversation? In this podcast, I'll share conversations with my friends and colleagues, people who inspire and challenge me in their ways of thinking, connecting and acting. These wonderful people are thinkers, doers, activists, scholars, writers, leaders, farmers, educators, people whose work informs permaculture and spark the imagination of of what a post-COVID, climate resilient, socially just future could look like. Their ideas and projects help us to make sense in this changing world, to compost and digest the ideas and to nurture the fertile ground for new ideas, connections and actions. Together we'll open up conversations in the world of permaculture design, regenerative thinking, community action, earth repair, eco-literacy and much more. I can't wait to share these conversations with you. Over the last three decades of personally making sense of the multiple crises we face, I always return to the practical and positive world of permaculture with its ethics of earth care, people care and fair share. I've seen firsthand how adaptable and responsive it can be in all contexts, from urban to rural, from refugee camps to suburbs. It helps people make sense of what's happening around them and to learn accessible design tools to shape their habitat positively and to contribute to cultural and ecological regeneration. This is why I've created the Permaculture Educators Program to help thousands of people to become permaculture teachers everywhere through an interactive online dual certificate of permaculture design and teaching. We sponsor global perma youth programs, women's self-help groups in the global south and teens in refugee camps. So anyway, this podcast is sponsored by the Permaculture Education Institute and our Permaculture Educators Program. If you'd like to find more about permaculture, I've created a four-part permaculture video series to explain what permaculture is and, and also how you can make it your livelihood as well as your way of life. We'd love to invite you to join our wonderfully inspiring, friendly and supportive global learning community. So I welcome you to share each of these conversations and I'd also like to suggest you create a local conversation circle to explore the ideas shared in each show and discuss together how this makes sense in your local community and environment. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I meet and speak with you today, the Gubby Gubby people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. It's my great pleasure to welcome to the show today, Matt Powers. Matt and I live on the other sides of the world from one another, but we share the same passion for permaculture education and sharing permaculture with young people. So Matt has been doing some incredible work in this space of permaculture education. He's the author of The Permaculture Student 1 and 2 um, and has developed a K-12 permaculture curriculum standards, which has been accredited through the national government in the United States. We also both love YouTube and online education and have also uh, shared a panel at the Permaculture UK conference about developing online material. So following on from his appearance on the Global Perma Youth Festival recently, where he was interviewed by my 14 year old daughter and also invited his eldest son along who joined in the conversation and played us some of his guitar too. Anyway, Matt kindly jumped back online with me to talk more about permaculture education and also to explore what's in his new book, the incredible book on regenerative soil. I hope you thoroughly enjoy this conversation with Matt. So I just wanted to to welcome you to the show, Matt. It's It's been such a, 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 it was wonderful the other day when you joined in with the Perma Youth and 
had that conversation with them. I know that they were absolutely buzzing from from just hearing your perspectives about what permaculture is and what it can do in the world and how they can really activate and be involved. And so it's lovely to to have this chance to kind of pick up off that conversation. I'll put links in our in the show notes about um, how where people can find that perma youth conversation. So mm-hmm. you know, what I really would love to explore with you because um like me permaculture seems to be your entire life frame in a way now that might be sort of overstating it but it's how it's how you raise your children it's how you work it's the focus of your writing it's you know everything that i see about you online it's coming through that lens of permaculture and so you know for you what is a permaculture life and and how did you how did you actually come to to enter into that space of permaculture being the the core or are there other parts as well that i'm not seeing <laughs> i'm making a big assumption no, here. <laughs> I, think you're, I think you're spot on um i think the part that like is is not well seen is because i was a high school teacher and i really wanted to respect all the different diversities within my group and belief systems i kind of like Null certain parts of myself out um, to the audience, and that would be that I I go to church on Sundays. Um, I I pray every day, we pray before our meals. You know, um, I I relate everything to everything in a way, and that's that's my that's like my strength and sometimes my weakness. Um, but but for me. I have to have a congruency. So my, 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 my perspective of what we're all trying to do, whether it's in so many of the world's religions, so many of what the good intentions and principle of the intention behind some of the good things that are, you know, misapplied energies um, and, and they get good intentions, but look at the damage they're doing, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I really see that it's all just trying to take care of people, take care of ourselves, people care. We're trying to take care of the earth that supports us. And there's this, this unbelievable relationship with nature that humans have always recognized, always gotten this deep energy recharged from. And there has been these unnatural time periods where we've lost that connection and it's come back. and. I think that that harmony with nature is the Adam and Eve story. Um, I think that like the, we are living in a fallen state and we are not natural with the way we're living mm. and it hurts. Mm. And the way we treat each other is not natural and it hurts. <laughs> um, it's, it's true, isn't it? So, there's a deep, there's a deep, um, it kind of wrenches your gut when you when you open yourself to it enough and you feel it and you feel the pain yeah. of, of the injustice. You feel the pain of the ecological destruction. You feel the pain of the species extinction. You feel the pain of the death that's happening now with with COVID. You feel the pain so deeply. And I from you know, I think it's that deep response to what you see around well i know for me anyway that ever since i was a kid it, it was this ah oh, gut it's like someone had punched you in the gut and unless there was some response that i could have that meant that i was able to do something about that i kind of felt adrift and i would feel right. like i couldn't to, breathe yeah. properly you know and it wasn't until i could actually find a way to feel like i was actually making a contribution where I could breathe again and and this knot would become fire you know and the fire is what fueled the the energy to actually keep going it's 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 not I don't have a mental plan of where I'm going with my work I'm totally fueled by this feeling that when you were just speaking it's like well yeah it's that it's the injustice it's the it's the destruction it's the hurt that you get when there's this violence against the thing which you are you are part of it is you are part of all life and when parts of it are being destroyed it it does hurt Hmm. and 
And as a as a teacher and as a parent, and as a generational thinker, and as someone who deeply honors and respects and values the diversity of belief all over the earth, permaculture provides a platform for mutual respect and reverence and a place for us to start building automaticity in, 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 in social and, and, and ha- like all, all the different layers of, of human habituation. We, the reason I think a huge part of the reason why there's so much strife in the world right now, there's so much psychic just, I mean, you look at the left and the right in America, it's like the worst qualities of both are coming out right now. Mm-hmm. And um, I think it's because we're living so unnaturally. I think it's because we are, are, are completely um, lacking a overlapping culture that we can like nod to each other and be like, yeah, one of us. You know, we're missing this relaxing routine of expectation of relations. And that that's like, and I'm not gonna attach value to any of these things in particular, just gonna list them. I mean, we had we had uniformity of of, of our of our culture, we had uniformity of our education, we had uh, almost every male was was in military service two generations ago. And they all could look to that and be like, mm, we went through it together. We'll get through this, you know. And there's this, there's all these different things. There was, there was, you know, the churches, there was uh afternoon play among the kids in the neighborhood. All these things are gone. Mm-hmm. And so, and we we do, and I mean, yeah, there, there's church, but um church attendance is down. The, there are community centers, but there's not as many. We're, we're seeing the commonality, the overlap in that beautiful structure of permaculture that we value so much, that overlap between cultures that actually allows us to forget our differences for a moment, be like, we're all in this together, we're one family, is missing. And, and so, so for me, I'm like, this is the piece. This is the the transcendent piece that like, you know what, we all care about each other though in the end. We all care about the earth in the end. That I saw that linked back to the the education, the the social. And I and I was like, if we could just teach kids this from a young age, we'd have completely different discussions, politics, governance, inventions, business. Mm. I, you know, and that, does that make sense, or did it? It absolutely that? makes yeah, sense because <laughs> <laughs> the thing about those places of connections, and I was having a really great conversation uh, yesterday about commons and the need for you know the recommoning of our place. Like, where are those where are those public spaces, those crossroads where we where we meet, and where those uh, you know almost accidental um, discoveries of each other happen as well. So that it could be a place yep. where we're just moving through, and rather than it being a commercialized space, that those public places are common spaces that are designed and managed and imagined by people for people, and a place where people just naturally gather and those interactions and relationships form. And because mm. both well, where the conversation was going was because places like you know, America and Australia are basically just big real estate developments where there's not really thinking about designing in those community spaces or even the food spaces for that matter, that we've kind of missed weaving into the fabric of our, the structure of our society in terms of the the infrastructure, the places where that humanity and connection can emerge. And I think that it really connects me back into the permaculture ideas. Is what I love about it too is the the design focus of it, how it mm-hmm. helps us to understand and see those patterns of connection, and then actually design in a way that can allow them to emerge, not to kind of like go right bang, I know it, but actually to understand that that's where the richness is, and to step back and create the conditions for those things. To happen and so design for me was a really important part of where permaculture comes from. I, 
I did landscape architecture and environmental planning and all those sorts of design things in uni. And I remember them telling me, oh, you know, like, um, designing with nature is passe and you know you design to make these big structures and I just wanted to design places for people <laughs> and so I stepped out I never worked as a as a as a professional landscape architect I was I just went straight into working with communities to help design community gardens I actually didn't tell them that I was a designer wow. I just worked because it but then your people would then go oh well, you're the expert you do it whereas that I think also that kind of sense of you know democratization and inclusion rather than just participation and doing it for you. But anyway, I'm talking too much. Um, so design. So, um, where well, does the design yeah, fit for you? Agree. Because the design gives you the lens that allows you to have the analysis. Everyone knows from English class or composition class, let's say. I mean. <laughs> we won't have English class everywhere, but um, where you're doing uh, studying literature, studying writing, studying composition and grammar, you're going to learn the mechanics, the components, and the interrelations and behaviors of words in prose. And, and suddenly you're going to read things and you're going to be able to see them. You're going to be able to recognize how things were put together, and then you're going to be able to do it yourself. And I think that's what's so amazing is that it's so natural that you show this information to children and they go, oh, yeah, I see the pattern there and there and there. And, and then they see it everywhere because they're meant to. And, and, and it just lights up. And I really do believe if we can get this, this lens of, of, and I see it as a lens because you you can you can design through it, but you also can diagnose through it. Mm -hmm. And so we look through this lens of permaculture and we see the world, we see the future. We see all these these things that aren't there that could be. And once they're there and this lens is common, it will be common sense. Mm -hmm. And it will be something that's implicit in everyone's basic education. I was writing a a little piece, uh, maybe an email that I'm gonna do about how it's like imagine if the three ethics were taught alongside the golden rule in kindergarten like what would that be like if everyone learned that if every business person every investor everyone every politician knew that everyone else every, everyone else in the world in their world knew that this is what we value these are the ethics these are the boundaries that would change everything. And it's so simple, it's so revolutionary. And it's, I think that, you know, a lot of people get caught up in minutia about, you know, do swales work in every moment in time and place? And will it work on the moon? You know, I mean, it's just like, we, you know, we have to calm down and focus on like the, the simple truths and the power that they can give us. Mm -hmm. And that's the same with, with a lot of the philosophies and and the amazing aspects of world religions. It's like, let's look at the simple truths that they're trying to bring, the simple things that they're trying to show. And we can honor those. We can like raise those up. And, and I think that that's what's missing. It's we're, we're getting hypercritical. And I think a part of it is because we're missing, we're missing basics in our lives that give us the kind of grounding. <laughs> Um, that, you know, that, that a simple life can give. I interviewed Rob Greenfield recently. I haven't put this out, but spoiler alert, he, he explains how not having stuff opens up like a meditative space in which that's, that thing like you could occupy. That's instead potential, raw potential, which meditatively is what we're doing like some, some of us not all of us are doing that kind of meditation but we i meditate on the unknown and on, on possibility and not what i know because what i know is you know what i mean known i want to know what i don't know i want to know what i'm wrong about i want to know what's what's possible that i haven't even thought about and and for me that gives me the greatest peace when i'm meditating and so not knowing being ignorant gives me the greatest peace Mm -hmm. um and so he just was talking about how the simplicity opens up all this possibility and it was like 
So I really feel like there's a lot to that too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and I think too, what I from what I see of the work that you do is that that stepping into that space of the unknown and that amplifying your curiosity just mm. opens up because you're asking questions and the questions then provoke interesting thoughts and research and connections and writings but also what i see you doing too is like i don't know about this i'm going to go and ask that person or i might go and ask that person actually reaching out and not you know this thing about okay i know so i'm a unit and knowing is in our in our the richness of the relationships of the people that we connect with and talk to and ask and be open also to sharing what it, the, the bits that we do know and and so i you know i heard you a while ago going around and meeting up with all these different people and and having great conversations and i think that too that the knowing that we don't know everything the knowing that we we will enrich our understanding through having conversations with people who are as curious as you are and as passionate you are about that kind of part of it and and where we all kind of connect is where this sort of amazing stuff happens and and um so you know some of the people that you've spoken to like who, who have been some of the people more recently that you've spoken to that have just inspired you and taken you to that edge of your like oh my gosh this is amazing kind of experience yeah you know i think that carol sanford challenged me in all these interesting ways it was really she is the person behind seven generations direction and name and the whole idea of, of, of going out seven generations she i haven't even released this talk because it was it was really interesting she felt pressed for time and everything I said, she'd be like, wait, but natural doesn't apply to humans. And I was like, wait, what's your definition of natural? And we like got into this rabbit hole of definitions. And it was for me, it wasn't even like the goal suddenly of the of the <laughs> of the conversation to be a podcast. It was suddenly was like to orient myself in the world of understanding and be like, wait a second, she's almost 80 and she is one of the sharpest most incredible women minds people whatever energies in the world i've ever met or ever encountered and her job is to ask questions to poke holes in things she said she's like so this won't be a normal interview and i was like okay <laughs> and she just was like humans are natural we move in and out of uh natural spaces natural is what is fixed what is static in place what is place is natural and i was like whoa and she was like this is what my grandfather taught me to think and it was just i love that i love being challenged with and like having that sea change of like wait explain it to me again <laughs> this is cool you know, I love it. <laughs> it is. It's great, isn't it? It's a disruptive event, and I think we can see that in a, in a, in in ourselves. We can see that in our communities. We can see it everywhere. I mean, there's this point where there's a it's either a, a breakthrough or a breakdown. But we do like disruption. You know, nature is not just this stable, fixed thing. It's this constant, fluctuating flexibility where the disruption is always um, pushing for further innovation to happen and creativity yeah. kind of really the source of yeah that's right and so we need to find a place to take if we are feel i don't know i also sometimes feel like i'm feeling just a little bit too settled and everything's just kind of i kind of need to open up the door somewhere else because it means that i've just got into that place of feeling just a little bit too comfortable and not challenging myself to find what the next but like it's not saying i don't I'm, i like also having that peaceful call like you're talking about but keeping the edges open because yeah it's, like i said it's the edge bit where the where the where that happens and an edge that is being opened recently i think is the whole world of homeschooling so i'm just kind of like jumping over there now because you homeschool i homeschool and um i also have i have one at school i have two that are homeschooled uh, unschooled really i guess and the world has um all of a sudden become this homeschool world 
And so there's a couple of questions that are kind of emerging as I'm starting to think about this is, one is that what has your, firstly, what has your experience been around homeschooling and why you chose to do that with your children uh, and how permaculture has been woven into that in whatever way? And the other part is what, where have you seen, uh, have people started to be contacting you because you have this permaculture curriculum, K to 12 permaculture curriculum for now they're home and they're going, well, what am I doing? Is this something that you're seeing people are really reaching out for or how are the ways that we can support more people to know about this because there's still still thousands and thousands and thousands of children who are home and um, I don't know, a lot of different questions in there. Feel free to go wherever you want with the homeschooling, unschooling, permaculture idea. Because some people feel quite uncertain, thinking, I, don't know, I couldn't, I couldn't homeschool. I, I wouldn't know what to do. I, I'm, you know, that's a lot well. Of there's, okay, so there's one side of that that's like you are that child's parent, and no one can actually reach that child in the way that you can, because you're the parent. Like there's that, that's like a truth. That's like the mirror neurons. There's the genetics. There's a you recognizing yourself and your child <gasps> and knowing <laughs> that you got to work through that in order to work through them. And you got, yeah, there's a lot of learning stacked all on top. Um, it's not easy. It is not easy, but we all can do it. The, the K through 12 experience deserves a closer look. <laughs> because and it, you know it's called different things in different countries and of course they have different programs but the, the standardized education model is highly flawed and at the upper echelons it works and so they they like they keep doing it but there's this thing called the prepudutic function and yeah of course it works for the people getting all the information but if you're going to cut off the top 20% of key information out of the curriculum and basically cap people's intelligences and in like the lower order um, colleges and, and community college universities, those kinds of things, it's just wrong. So I, I learned like, so all right, when I was becoming a teacher, I was giving dumb, uh, dumbing us down, which is a book about what I just talked about, about how the system was designed to basically rob most of people of a real education and award a very small select group of people. And, you know, that's a socioeconomic group, you know, traditionally in American history, if you, you know, study that. Um, and so it's really a messed up history. I was really lucky and went to a top 40 university. I went to a top, I was like 40, uh, NYU was like 44, 45 when I went to it in the nation. And, and so that was when I went to college. I was an English major. I went and taught in the sixth most violent county in America. And the 11th graders were like faking to read hop on pop. And they were being like told crazy stuff and they weren't being motivated, given any kind of respect. And it like freaked me out. And then I noticed all the other teachers were homeschooling. And I was like, oh, my word. You guys are homeschooling. They're like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like all the higher educated folk in our area of California were doing it, you know, all themselves. It's just like, you know, it's not what you would expect. But once you get under the hood and see what they're... All right, so in ninth grade, I was a... Uh, when I was a, when I had a master teacher and I was doing my internship year, my student teaching year, I was in a classroom, a ninth grade classroom, and they didn't know what an outline was. Mm -hmm. And they called my, the outline I introduced, the powers outline. And they shared it among everyone. And I was mortified because this was fifth grade information. And so I was frightened. And so we started homeschooling. We started homeschooling the way they school. And we were like, oh, my word, this is awful. My child literally can't take this stuff seriously because we always just talked to him like he was an adult. Mm -hmm. 
And so we started doing all this adapted stuff, started doing project based um, because that was the best practice I was learning as a master's, uh, getting my master's degree. Um, and then I, I started studying unschooling and seeing these people who weren't forced, who learned dialectically, who learned through experience, who learned through curiosity, mm-hmm. who came through their childhood with intact curiosity and, and, and in tra- intact, um, like emotionally, um, in a way that, um, we don't really see very much anymore. And so I just, and, and I met these boys that were homeschooled that were sweet. And I say sweet because it's so clear when you've got a 12 or 13 year old boy that's sweet. And if you're a parent, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And I think it has to do with when we have them in, in a, a mob situation they start establishing hierarchy and like pecking order among young males and if there's not someone there to moderate like in a boy's bathroom or locker room or something like that you almost instantly if the wrong elements are there you develop this mindset and this culture that causes all these problems um, and makes them feel unstable makes them feel unsafe um, so they can't feel like they can afford to be sweet Mm-hmm. Um, fight or flight constantly. Um, and so I saw this and I was like, you know what? I grew up in a family of all boys. We were always constantly hitting each other. My brothers broke each other's legs and arms, put each other in a hospital with stitches. I've got two boys. I want to get through this. And so I just was like, I'm going to figure this out, you know? And I was like, I really want my boys to be good, be sweet, and good, wholesome, good. And they are, Mm -hmm. and it is a fantastic thing to have a 14 year old boy who is just good, sweet. And he does mindless, you know, forgetful things. And you're like, what are you doing? That was the last thing you didn't ask. No, I mean, there's an automaticity. There's like, um, you know, it's, it's part of them re-knitting the front of the brain to the back of the brain is what I've heard. Um, but, but it happens around like nine or 10, um, and they have to just be like retrained. It's amazing how fourth and fifth grade boys are so much more mature than seventh and eighth grade boys. Mm. And it's okay. It's just something that we have to recognize (laughs) and work around. Um, I have a 12 year old at the moment, a 12 year old boy where, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. And, and even the homeschoolers and unschoolers understand. But I also had homeschoolers after I got into it that were like, what do I do with my boy? All he does is play video games. He's got no drive. And James, I was able to plug him in. I'm going on a tangent. Plug him in to his real curiosity. At first it was horses. Then it was metallurgy. And he was like searching. And we like let him like follow those really deep. But now, as a musician, he's always like played music. But now, I mean, he's not playing because I'm doing this. He yeah. would be in that garage recording. And he is like a fanatic, like a nerd, but at the best possible level, he is going to become professional in his understanding of these things. And he's already professional. I mean, we record with Grammy winning artists for his first, his first song and his first EP. He and and he and he did that when he was I think 13, maybe 12. I can't remember. Maybe 13. But but my point is that because I saw these things early on, I hopped into it. I saw what these unschoolers, that's what my point was that I got unhitched from. I saw this guy, this French guy who was raised by neuroscientists who purposely didn't teach him anything. Purposely. And they, the kid was brilliant. Mm -hmm. And I was just shocked. And I just watched this and heard his explanation. And I was like, oh my word. I felt like, like all the different like things I'd learned. And I was like, 
I didn't see any contradictions in it. And that's the other thing. I'm maybe unique in that I hold the things that I read in my head. Literally. My mom can pull up paragraphs from law tracts she's read and recite them in the middle of a debate that's televised. She did this when I was a child. Yeah. Try getting, you know, around that, right, as a child. So, but I'm good at holding things in my head. And so I, um, I ran it by everything that I, 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 I can't remember his name. It's Alex, uh, Alexis, like Sergio or something like that. But anyway, he is, I remember his line there, he goes, my name is Alex and I've never been to school and I don't like candy. <laughs> and it's a TED talk and it's fabulous. <laughs> I can't remember his name for the life of me, but he, he just was so spot on, so clever, so funny, so smart. And what he said was by the time he was 12 or 13, he was so eager, wanted to know that he had his parents hire personal tutors. And in seventh grade, I went away to school where we learned 20 minutes. We condensed the classes to 20 minutes. You learn with one instructor, you have classes go like that. And then you hit the gym, you run outside in shorts and t-shirts in 20 degree weather, and then you ski the rest of the day. You did that. And I was, yes, I did that. And I was alongside Olympians like in training uh -huh. and I was not an Olympian in training. I was good. I mean, I would finals and states and stuff. And that's good. But, but my, my brothers were junior Olympians and my roommates went to the Olympics recently. And so like, like Bodie Miller, like the gold mountain medalist, American skier, like recognized me and I didn't recognize him. He was like, little powers. Whoa. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> my brothers were really good. I just got to tag along, but, but I, I got to be immersed in this educational situation that gave me the understanding of what we actually have to do to help kids mm -hmm. to learn. We have to mimic a one-on-one -on -one relationship, keep them completely accountable. And I tried to do that to a degree through the computer. And that's why I'm probably pretty good at it online with all my courses. Because I was trained at an Apple certified high school where we only had laptops, no textbooks, and the reason I'm good at curriculum is because as I was being trained and took my master's, I was literally writing new curriculum every day for four years straight, because mm -hmm. that's how I ran my class. I wrote the curriculum on the fly in response to the kids' desires, dreams, proclivities, and prior understanding mm -hmm. so that I could connect those things and pull them up faster. And Which I ended up teaching that, them the stuff yeah. that, that at, was at NYU. Yeah, yeah. I think the responsiveness is 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 the key. And so, so bringing this conversation back into the into your curriculum, your permaculture curriculum, then. Um, so connecting that way of thinking about being um, responding, having that flexibility, meeting a child where they are, or meeting a learner where they are, um, whether they're a child or not. Um, so. How do you encourage people to use your curriculum then in order to be in that creative space and that responsive space? I was explaining this to someone. I was explaining this to someone, the perspective of I do not like the teacher that goes in there and teaches out of the book, but knows nothing of what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Administrators like almost like these people because they can pop them in anywhere. Mm -hmm. I like want to like, be the person that goes into the temple and flips all the money changers tables over in that moment, because it's insane. You need fluency in the topic you're teaching to actually teach from depth and leverage to relate to the actual pictures and prior understanding in the child's head. I was not nice to other teachers <laughs> when I was a teacher because I I'm so deeply passionate. I feel like we're robbing the kids, like outright, of their opportunity for proper growth. And so I feel like everything should be a choice. Everything should be a, a menu. Everything should be a discussion from principles, from the core of why you're teaching this lesson, what the objective is, why it even matters but do it in a way that feels natural, you know, do it in a way that actually resonates with that kid and that group of kids. 
And so I, I, I really, I, I, I've designed all my curriculums to be these really in-depth menus mm -hmm. and design with all the pieces so that they would understand that multiple kinds of learning can fit into this and will come out of this. And I design really open-ended projects so you can like ver vary this part, vary that part, so that it, when you discuss it with the kids, they're like, oh, well, I'm going to do this, this, and this. And just them thinking that, being like, oh, yeah, you can do a compost pile probably a thousand different ways. That thought alone, seeing the beginning, the middle, the end of the process and the modulation of them, that alone is a lesson. And the fact that they're holding in their head and they're making a choice about it means that they're saying yes to it before they've even done anything. And the, the, the good that that does for their learning, their memory, their deeper understanding, their um, ability to get their bodies to jump up and do things, their, so their body listens to their mind, like that kind of stuff is, is what we get when we properly teach. So I, and not only that, my, I try to really design my stuff so that, um, like the K through 12 course, as holistic as possible. I mean, there's, you know, gardening, cooking, seed saving, plant profiles, and then design, you know? And so they see how this fits into the strategy of design, and then they can actually go do it. And they're like, this is going to fit into there. I'm going to take this into the compost and, and and so I really try to do that so it's authentic because that's it's I mean it's difficult. Teaching is the oldest profession, and I would say it's the most demanding profession. So so yeah, no, I, I wish I could make my online course like you know, absolutely one on one, but that's kind of why I love teaching to families in the homeschooling environment. Because I, I talk to them as a group. They discuss it as a group. They start doing the things as a group. And that group discussion, understanding, I mean, talk about beautiful iteration, stepping up and down the scaffolding of understanding, you know what I mean? Extending the proximal, you know, understanding limits of our kids. It's, it's all there. So, and, and because of the mirror neurons, because we're the, the parents or the longtime caregivers, we actually have that connection that they learn faster mm -hmm. and hold it and value it totally different because they love you. <laughs> and and then when I also when I was um in Africa, what was it the year before last, working with some of the groups over there, part of what's trying to happen over there are people starting up new schools but having permaculture at the core. And I've heard them mm talking about your curriculum as well saying you know we we actually need to be able to rethink what our education is about because what we've got at the moment isn't working it's not meeting our needs the kids that are coming through this you and i spoke to the young kids their goals were either to become a corporate lawyer or to become an engineer i think were the two main things that i heard and there wasn't really much option and you look around and go I can't even see a company, let alone, you know, like it was, we're in villages. And, um, and so, yeah. so that's that sort of that drive that you, you go towards this pointy wedge of these particular professions and anything else is really not, not important to think about or to learn about. And anything to do with putting your hands in the soil is going backwards. And actually punishment was going out to the garden. And so trying to sort of flip that around um, with permaculture and, so uh, the the question within this is um what kind of conversations have, have you been having with with people over in countries like um Af well okay. kenya uganda was the place i was thinking like with charles mugurura he was one of the ones who i know that you've had conversations with before as well yeah yeah i get consistently reached out to um from a lot of different people in africa uh, about permaculture and about teaching it, uh, about having me come over there. And it's, it's, and, and I think that the greatest education I got on it was in a podcast with Natalie Topa. Do you know Natalie? Natalie, you yeah. You do know Natalie yeah. very well because your video in my course, um, I, 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 I highlight your YouTube video in my course, um, with Natalie. 
um, because it's so good. Her balcony gardening gives, I think, gives all people in urban urban situations hope. Um, but but she just was like Matt. You have to understand that people are refugees twice over, three times over, and and I mean, I understand shock. I understand PTSD. Um, I was, you know, I was in 9-11. I was at NYU when that happened. I lived there during like the whole, you know, no demilitarized zone kind of stuff, checkpoints and all that, and machine guns on the streets. And um, and so I, I feel like that panic and if that kept happening, you know what I mean? I think like like we wouldn't be able to do very much. And I think that's a slow motion thing of what's happening now in America. Um, which which says a lot, right, about the strain that these these cultures are taking. Um, and as Alan Savory would say, what's social and economic is mirrored in the ecological. And I don't know if I have, you know, enough information um, to to give wise enough answers, you know. Um, um, for all the problems that I've been, you know, asked about, you know, in those regions. I do know that starting with permaculture, um, showing those values, teaching it to kids, uh, getting that local economy, that local food economy to start to shift. Mm -hmm. We can get them to shift and get them to start eating healthier food. And like, where, how are you growing this food? Um, John Kemp talked about how during the locusts, uh, attacking everything, the farms that were using um, his methods of foliar sprays were the only ones that were untouched and everyone was coming to them and asking questions. And, and so it's like we have to find those edges to start in and inoculate the consciousness. But I don't want to, to claim or, 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 or assume that I have the answer because I feel like people like Charles people like yourself who have relationships and, and that deeper understanding of, of the place will have a better understanding. But I, but I, but I, again, I think that it starts with education. It starts with those three ethics as a basis of commonality and common understanding that generates the common sense that provides the boundaries of a culture that would be regenerative. And I think you're so right. I, think I mean, there's, there's no, there's no way that you could possibly even know from sitting where you're sitting what's going on there. And, you know, even having been there, you know, I, I only know what I know from the, the bits that I see, but it is exactly, it's the relationships and it's the it's the connection and it's the offering. It's, you know, like the Perma Youth event that we were both at the other day. Um, within that group, um, oh, the, it wasn't that group because it was the wrong time zone for them, but the one before that, mm. we actually had groups. There would be like a window and there'd be um, kids from a refugee camp in Uganda. There'd be kids from a refugee camp in, in Kenya. Then connecting up and relating and having this, this, these conversations opening up and saying, you know, what, you know, what is it that you're struggling with over there? And then just starting to have this conversation. Oh, I know this. This resource might be useful, and then from them identifying what it is that they need, then sort of helping to offer bits and pieces into that, and and them shaping it up. So there's some, some amazing perma youth programs happening out of refugee camps that are now actually going out of refugee camps into the neighbouring areas because it's it's got such cohesiveness there, which is it's just mind blowing. And again, you sort of can't plan it, but you can feed it and support it and and relate and communicate and just be open so every day just about having conversations with people trying to you know like I was on the phone last night to to Charles because I know that he's got a group of teachers who can go and help and there was a, another refugee camp in Uganda and so he's helping to link them up with that and I'm sort of helping to find what support I can so it's just this global permaculture network that's myceliating and and responding continuously to that and so just picking up again on a thread that you mentioned as you were you were talking before was about um alan savory and holistic he you know from his holistic farm management and as i was reading through 
the copy of your new regenerative soils book, one of the, the last thing you talked about was holistic soil management plans. So we're just kind of like leaping yeah. out of Africa into soils because um, this is your new book, Regenerative Soils. Uh, is it soil or soil? Sorry, I think I got that wrong. It's regenerative it, soil. Regenerative soil. It is a remarkable book. I mean, thank you so much for being so rigorous in documenting I guess your research and your curiosity and you had so many questions about it which we all have and you've gone and done the research and put it down there for us so we can all see you know like what's going on in the soil what does that mean how does that work what are the relationships that's happening what does that compost actually do what does that what you know what does that worm castings do what do all those things do and then bringing that back beautifully in that last chapter and really looking at what are the best ways to test your soil and how can you create a holistic soil management plan and I would love for you just to describe what a holistic soil management plan is and and how you got to that point of saying this is what I reckon we should all be doing (laughs) well okay so this is the thing is I I when I set out to write this book I got went to the research and then quickly got um, disoriented and realized that, you know, when they say we only know 1% of, of the soil microbes and that we know space better than, you know, the soil is true. And I was like, oh, wait. And I like realized that I had to like, I had to go way deeper and go way farther and that this last section of the book that you're talking about was written after i talked to my peer reviewers because i was like how do i like tie it up because it's like so much like i'm going through all the cycles of all the essential nutrients for plants and that's never been done before visually Mm -hmm. and so i had i spent the longest period of time in this that was spent in documenting like all the pieces for this book was creating the illustrations for the just the basic ecological like soil cycles for each element because they didn't exist and the ones that did exist were either like purely agricultural like this is the fertilizer this is the leaching agent like or it was like ecological like this is what contaminants happen in a, in a forest watershed and so I had to like go through all the literature and find out each piece in each instance and craft the actual connections into a visual thing. And sometimes it was soup and I had to like rearrange it until it actually created this, 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 this movement that I could, that I could comprehend. And once that I felt like I could comprehend it, I felt like others could. And, and, and luckily, <laughs> Luckily, it remains it remains the case that when I bring it down to what my level is, even an eighth grader understands it just as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, well, so I love so, the way that you're communicating the book in a really accessible way because it does. It, you know, soil scientists is one of those ones that you can actually get into and just start falling asleep before you get to page five because it's so dense and you, your mind just sort of shuts down. Whereas this is not. This is this is. Oh, this is opening the doors to soil science in a way that I've not seen before. Yeah, and so it was exciting, and I felt like I felt carried by this excitement. And then I was really, it was easy to write an exciting book because everything I was doing, I was like, this doesn't exist. <laughs> this doesn't exist. And I'm like writing people, I'm like texting John Kempf, the Regen Ag uh, podcast guy, and he's like, no, that doesn't exist. And I'm like, it doesn't exist. See, I'm calling you right now. <laughs> um, but but it was this Pandora's box and I got to the end of it and I was like, OK, I got to talk to my peer reviewers. And John was able to like, I was like, what are the steps? What are the hierarchy? It's like what matters most? What matters first? Like how do these things like these different clades influence each other? when we're actually implementing them in a remediation kind of way. And he was able to walk me through it in a way that, um, and it's actually public. It's in the podcast I did with him. 
And this will really actually show how my mind works for people because um, I took that and I turned it into charts and I boiled that conversation down into eight, uh, well, actually five essential elements. And that's really how it works for me. I, like, I need it to be basic to understand it, to, to manipulate it, to develop, to develop a fluency. Maybe this is why I was a bass player, right? I need just, you know, the whole note. <laughs> but, um, but I broke it down into these key, these key elements um, that make up regenerative soil. And regenerative soil is soil that gets better and better every year. And there are specific metrics into that and that feed into that. And they are the overlapping components. And so it's soil organic matter. It's uh, the carbon levels of your soil, essentially. How much CO2 are the plants transmuting and bringing down into your soil, essentially, really? Um, the minerals. You know, if you don't have selenium in your soil and you're in the Midwest of America, you just don't have it. Mm -hmm. um, it would be great if it magically was there. It's just not. Um, <laughs> so you might have to add it a teeny, teeny, teeny bit. A lot of these minerals, you don't have to add very much at all. But they're so critical in so many different ways, as I cover in the book, that to not have them um, just makes your plants disease prone, makes your plants open for, for you know, an animal to, or uh, an insect to just come in and drain or a disease or fungal blight or, or anything. Um, so, so minerals are really critical. There's something I didn't fully consider earlier on in my writing and, and thinking about all this space because I didn't encounter it, and it was actually David Holmgren's book, Retro Suburbia, that I was like, why is David so focused on minerals? I feel so conscious. <laughs> um, and then, um, and the, it's, it's these, it's these um, let me see if I can go to here really quick. No, it's, it's here. So, so then it's like really the life, the biology of the soil. And so, We've gone to the point where people have mapped a lot of the beneficials, but they already were mapped because they were used for other purposes in the lab. Mm -hmm. Like Bacillus med megatarium is mega big. And that's why. Um, like I, I highlight this in the book so that people know that these are like famous microbes that were like, hey, these help plants too. Like brewer's yeast is endophytic in plants all over the earth. Mm -hmm. So fermentation into alcohol is completely built into nature. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's, it, it, you know, it's a biostimulant um, as well, um, and, but it's endophytic. And so it's, um, it, it, so basically the life in the soil, in the plant, on the plant surface, uh, understanding that and being able to, to lift that up is incredibly important. Uh, and then cover crops. These are essentially lenses, just like permaculture lenses. I think of these as lenses so you can design through them or you can diagnose through them. Um, and then there's plants because photosynthesis is better. Or if you have the best in the world ever documented compost, you're 24% in comparison to 0.5% um, uh, a year with annual soil organic matter um uh, additions with photosynthesis versus um compost i butchered that um but but basically compost can't compete with photosynthesis not if you've got healthy plants and and you could be doing the johnson sioux compost in the giant bioreactor and waiting a whole year and you did all the work and then it's half as good as you just having a cover crop mm -hmm. Which is, which, which, you know, if you've gardened long enough, you've seen like plants do this stuff to the soil and you're like, this is amazing soil. And you're like, but these plants just grew in it. <laughs> and there's this like realization, you're like, these plants are doing stuff. These plants and microbes are doing stuff. Um, and, and then, and then aeration and hydration and air and water are, 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 are are complicated because so many of us live in really diverse locations where we might have um, like tropical settings where you, you won't have aerobic soils, you'll have facultative soils. They'll be regularly waterlogged. And instead of nodulating, they freely associate with nitrogen fixing microbes 
because there's no need because there's a low oxygen in the environment to begin with. So, so I, I really want to like put that out there because I don't want to pro, uh, keep pushing along this idea that aerobic soils are superior. Um, that's that. I mean, go look at the most productive rainforests on Earth. You will not find these black, you know, aerobic soils. You're going to find very efficient facultative soils where you're not going to see nutrients flowing in the water really because they're going to be handed off so efficiently and this is something that's in that podcast with john that blew my mind that applies to so much more and and, and, and complicates some things for some people but opens up a whole door for us is that when soils are truly healthy they don't test like they have nutrients mm -hmm. What's going on is the nutrients are trapped in the biology and they're handing it off hand to hand. They're like, here you go. They're, the economy is so efficient that they've sponged up all the, the loose stuff. No one's just like excreting and letting it out or no one's dying and then it's just going. It's all being taken in. It's all coded and partnered. And we can see the same thing with, um, with the atmosphere and carbon in the oceans. If we ramp up the engine that cycles carbon, we can handle higher carbon levels and get this. You won't even see it. Mm -hmm. The carbon is heavier than oxygen and it falls. And so we're exhaling it. If we're surrounded by a food forest, it won't escape the food forest to infect those ice cores in Antarctica. No, no, no. It will stay within the engine of life mm -hmm. and it will feed those plants. We must realize that if we bring back nature we bring back the forest we bring back the kelp forest we bring back the animals all of it we will find balance faster than we can believe all the metrics and all the scary things and all those things they could happen sure but the reality is we have a clear path that has bumpers on the side that has safety at the end of it and it's it's nature Nature has the full capacity to take all the carbon in, to cycle it at such a great level that it simply disappears from, from, from the way we even test. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so anyway, I just want to, I went on a tangent there, but I wanted to share that. And, and so aeration and hydration, we got to really recognize that these things are, are necessary, but depending on the crops, depending on the climate, depending on your situation, it'll be a little bit different. And I talk about that in there. And so if we look at these lenses and look at our context, we've got to keep that permaculture hat on. Um, we suddenly see, oh, well, I don't have soil organic matter um, and, uh, or, or I don't have the minerals I need. Maybe you're in Australia and they never have nice age. They never had those glaciers come and plow and make that rock flower from the granite and add it to our soils. You're going to have that, you know, bring in the kelp, bring in the sea minerals and all those different things and maybe do some testing, maybe do some plant sap analysis to see what actually is flowing because what's in the soil tests is not always what the plants uptake. And that's another like revelation of this book is that um, John Kemp talks about this a lot too, if you're following that number, the revelation, but um, seeing all these things in conjunction was what I did. And I aligned it so that we could be like, how are our soil organic matter levels? Where do they need to be? What are our minerals? What are we high in? Could be toxic in. What are we low in? What are we completely deficient in? Um, and, and when we analyze these things, when we think about what biofertilizers we could add, what indigenous biofertilizers, and I mean biofertilizers as in the microbes, mm -hmm. the fermentation big barrel biofertilizer thing is actually not in the scientific language. Mm -hmm. That's a slang term that, um, that got created. And you could combine the two, you could put biofertilizer in the fermentation and have, you know, um, like a bioreactor happen and create more microbes that way. But when I say biofertilizer, I'm specifically referring to endophytes, archaea, fungi, bacteria that are going to stimulate growth 
and stimulate and stimulate immunological functioning of the plant to heighten. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can you can create a whole you can build these things out from your own site in you know, healthy soil if you have it, or you could be bringing it in, or you could be selecting it from farms around you or wild spaces around you. I leave it wide open because I can't assume. The world's so diverse um, that I've really created a menu. Mm -hmm. As always, right? Trying to honor the student, let them make the choice. Because once they make the choice, they've already said yes. They've already taken an action, and and they're doing it, not me. And so I, I think it's really critical. And so that's why I have charts. I have things that you fill out. You know, I have things that um, we, I have questions in in this book. Um, and so you would go through this, you know, holistic checklist. And you would go back in the book to the soil organic matter solution section. You would go through the mineral amendments and you would see the overlap. And you're like, man, I need kelp because it's going to hit four out of five. And when I put uh, amend my kelp, I'm going to do it with a, a compost tea, or maybe you're going to do it with, um, you know, uh, you're going to do an IMO mix, natural farming. Maybe you're going to do a Johnson Sioux slurry. You're going to, you're going to do it all at the same time. And, and when you have that fluency, when you know the effects of each of these things, it allows you, it's like when you're teaching homeschool and you could play, probably resonate with this, you're like, oh, no, no, no. When you do this thing that covers science and history and English, because you're going to write an essay about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's like, it's real. If you have that fluency, you totally can stack all these functions, stack all this learning. And um, that's what I've really tried to do is make it so that it's actionable comprehensible, and anyone can pick it up and go, whoa, I'm doing this. <laughs> like in, in, in five to 10 minutes, you know, maybe a minute of just seeing all these different lenses. So that's what Brilliant. I'm trying to do. <laughs> it, and so when is it available for, for people to, to access this amazing book of yours? I have approved the cover and we are in the final stages. I'm just waiting for them to say that they're printing it. I've approved of, of all the bits. The printers have it. They also have Forgotten Food Forest, which is about a 3,000 year old food forest in Morocco that's real. And I had this, cause you know, I got boys. So I imagine these two brothers fighting and getting lost and separated from the family. And then this sandstorm comes and, and then the food forest saves them. So I've got that book too right now. Oh, but yes, I saw that. That's amazing. <laughs> Gosh, where do you find it? Like, yeah. yeah, I mean, after you've answered this question about when pe when can people get this this new soils book, um, I don't know. Is it something you can say a little bit about your writing process? Because this is something that always impresses me about you that you're able to take these ideas and not just be teaching them, but writing them and sharing them in that way too. Um, Always so so impressed with your capacity to do that, and I wonder what's your what is your writing process? Do you have a? I mean, that's a probably big question, but maybe it's a few key writing writers tips. <laughs> sure. Well, okay. So here's the thing: I was the exploratory creative writer, right? What you feel, you're learning. Oh, this is happening. Ah, oh, I just wrote this. I didn't even think I was going to write this. I did all that. I crashed and burned. You could probably find some of my short stories online and read them. Um, and, and I became an English teacher. And I had put away my writing and I had stopped writing. And I just started writing curriculum. And I got to this point where I have a teacher voice and I can write with my voice. But it's also like, I don't want to share anything unless it's like true and very valuable. Mm. And, and, and so I've like, I've like done this thing where I've stripped down, like I just stripped down to like everything down to like the bare bones. I'm like, what do I need here? What would be the least like best possible thing to do? And that's why I ended up becoming an illustrator with this book mm. because I couldn't pay someone enough money to do the drafts that I did. When I say it took two to three months, I literally spent, and I did it on Keynote. So we're not talking about Photoshop here or the pen. I'm like, click, 
And then I grab the thing that the, the line that I made and I'm bending it out and I'm bending it down and then I'm bending it. Totally different, weird way of drawing. But I spent three months doing this um, and it's building out that understanding and, and basically like putting my complete understanding into a, like a visual in, and then using as little words as possible to describe that. Mm -hmm. um, and I see it kind of like, like a craftsman would, like a woodcutter or like a sculptor would. Um, yeah, and so, and so I, I, I love writing. It's, it's definitely like, a, I have a writing course even. Um, and awesome. some of the people that I reference in my books have taken my course. So wild. Um, but, but yeah, no, I like love teaching. I love thinking about the, the mechanics of writing. My son right now is writing a book, uh, two books and, and I'm helping him. And I've, I've consulted with numerous people who have gotten like book deals on like, I, I help create their outline for them. I, I just love it. So, so I, I really feel like you need a plan. The number one thing is you need a complete outline, an outline that's so exciting. That you're like, I just need to fill in this, fill in this, fill in this, and I'm done. It's going to be amazing. Um, and then that pairing it down and being authentic, like talking with your voice. And that, you know, that takes time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> unless natural. You know, there are naturals out there too. Yeah. Um, but um, to dive back to the question of regenerative soil, the printer has it. It'll be uh, two to three weeks before I get it. Uh, if the long lines are long, maybe four weeks, mm -hmm. but then I'm shipping it out to everyone. And I have like a surprise about it. And I haven't like told anyone about it. Maybe like this is the like a moment that I could share. <laughs> um, but I'm releasing it at hardcover and I haven't told anyone. Oh my gosh. So everyone's going to get these like, and, and like in my mind, in my mind, I'm like, these things are going to be indestructible. Like, this is the first time I'm going to be shipping books around the world. I'm going to be like, this is going to be fun. Like, I am so excited. Like, cause that's like the thing that mortifies me. Like if someone gets a damaged book, like I have books on the shelf there. You can see all those purple books. Those are mine. They've got ding corners. I can't sell ding corners. I, no, I'm too much of a book person. <laughs> so, so I, I'm not going to turn it. I'm not going to turn the computer around. But my, I am surrounded by this library of books that I have collected for years. Um, none of them mine. Um, they're, they're all. I one day I'll write a book. But I books are my thing, and I mm. absolutely love sitting down and just absorbing different perspectives. And then, you know, I know where everything is it's like, oh, that idea, that idea. It's like this, there's a world of ideas that are surrounding me. And um, and it just, they sometimes I have got a whole, my, you know, my favorite latest ones here, you know, like Rob Hopkins one, his and, um, Animate Earth by, you know, about Guy Theory with Stephen Harding from Schumacher College, Guy Theory. And then there's, you know, Kate Rayworth's book about um, donut economics and, you know, it goes on and on. I love it. Absolutely love. Have you heard about? Have you heard about how they've been drilling into the deepest holes in the earth, and they're finding diamondized water, and there's life inside the water, oh, and they no. were expecting to find magma that close to the. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating when we talk about our living Earth and Gaia and the new, and I'm referencing uh, a Seeker um, video. If you look on Seeker and type in diamond water or type in new form of water, you'll find it. It's fascinating because it opens up like, again, more Pandora's boxes of curiosity <laughs> so that we could like, like see all these different metaphors play out through all of our traditions, all of our oldest religions and texts, living waters. Mm -hmm. Life comes from living waters deep inside the bowels of the earth. What? <laughs> it's really, it's thrilling. So I, I just get re really excited. And in fact, this library that's out is, is, is a secret. And this is something that I do when I'm writing a book is I only leave out the books that I'm working with. Yeah. And I put away all the other books that might distract me and take me on tangents. And, and, and 
I honestly don't have enough shelf space for like all my libraries. I have them in boxes. But but yeah, if you really want to dive into something, create a library around it. Read the books and develop a fluency. And so what I have, you know, like papers printed out and cataloged. I've created my own like library of published journals that I've printed off online and and done all this with. Um, and that was like part of my process of writing as well. So, so yeah, that's what I would say. And, um, the book, the idea behind the book is that I would get it to everyone before the holidays so that they could give it out as a gift. Oh, fantastic. And that's still my goal. And we're on target to do that so that, um, folks could share that. And the crazy, unbelievable thing I think about this book is that whatever you are into now, this will only enhance it. Mm -hmm. it it's it's going to give you more options. It's going to allow you to understand the other guys and, and gals. You know, it's going to allow you to understand the, the, their different way of doing it. Because, I mean, if you're like, oh, no, no, I'm a pure Elaine. Elaine's changed her way of doing compost, too, now. They're like, let's like, let's get into it. Let's have conversations. Let's look across the board and follow these actual formulas so we know the biochemistry knowing the individual microbes and enzymes so we know what actually these things can and are doing, it opens up a, a door to the reader, to you, actually making these decisions and choices and, and perceiving what's actually going on. And, and I, I find that incredibly exciting. And it's, again, it's me giving the menu, giving the driver's seat you know, over to you because I honestly feel like it's like, the people in the context in permaculture are going to make the better decision than the designer from another country who, you know what I mean? It's empowering those local people, those people who, who are, have been born there, who, you know, taste that water, been, you know, care about that tree, care about that, you know, landscape. Um, and do you and, know what they actually act really as need? These need? They need these options now and they need this kind of information. But it, what I'm hearing all the time every week is that, our soil has been destroyed by chemical agriculture. Our governments and our um, extension offices only suggest that we do that, you know, the, our, because of the um, the way that the land was closed during colonisation and taken, and that the shifting agriculture was because it used to be shifting agriculture, and when that changed, the land didn't get a chance to regenerate. So when you sort of stop in one space. And then you just do the one thing over and over and over and it's depleting the soils. It's saying, you know, we're left with this, this soil that's dead. And, and what do we right. do? What do we do? Is the cut is so this to be able to share this like, okay, here's a menu of things you could look around. What can you find in your environment that you could use to actually start to activate the life back in this soil? And not about like, okay, you need this ingredient, this ingredient. Like, what is it that's around you? Like, look. And, and with that yeah. structure of, of the information and the sort of the pattern of the information, I think then that's going to help to unlock so much potential in all these different contexts. So I hear you're also going to run a, a soils course. Tell me about that. Yeah. So it's I, 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 whenever I write a book, I see it as, as, as pairing it where I finally can teach. Um, I didn't write a full curriculum that was it was actually standards based until I created the permaculture standards and had it vetted. Um, I I need that kind of structure, and so now that I've created the book and I have all the pieces, now I can teach it. And so this winter I'm going to be creating the course. I have absolutely the advanced permaculture student online starting in three weeks from yesterday or two days ago. Um, and so I've got that starting, I've got this book shipping happening and I've got to film a mini course, an intro course and 12 week course version of regenerative soil for my Kickstarter. Wow. So I'm going to be doing that this winter. Um, the fires have made a lot of disruptions for me. We've had to be evacuated. We, um, we've got a trailer, we've got everything in boxes. I mean, there's there's boxes behind me because this goes into the you know and just we go um at a moment's notice and so you know i'm not gonna lose anything we're good 
but it's been disruptive. We I've not been able to do as much as I wanted to do and and it's been stressful. So we're going to we're going to enjoy our Christmas break and then I'm going to dive into it. Actually, you know it's so funny I haven't even mentioned this, but I'm I have our future January 20 January 14th through 17th which is an online free regenerative entrepreneurship conference with incredible speakers. Oh, wow. Great. Right. You know, from all walks of, you know, regenerative businesses, all walks of life. Um, we have William Padilla Brown, the mycologist. We have, um, we have Neil Speckman uh, of, of the Albeda project, you know, Green the Desert in Saudi Arabia, but he designed it so that it would be a profitable business. Mm. Um, we have, all these incredible people. If you go to our dash future dot world, you can see all the speakers there. I think that there's 16 up. We have um, Vinny, uh, Vinny Coco, who's uh, he's actually if you watch Shark Tank, you've definitely seen him. He's the Coco Taps guy. He patented a zero waste um, Coco tap so that you can put this tap into a coconut, use it and then take that and you can even put it in the ocean and within 30 days, it's fish food. So he designed it to be zero waste. Um, and he's one of the, one of the other speakers. Um, we have Antoinette Marquez, uh, creator, founder of Amacy Beauty, who takes uh, seaweeds and creates incredible skin products. Um, so there's all these regenerative entrepreneurs that will be having teach us how to start our own businesses how to work with what we've got in our bioregion, follow our passions, follow our dreams. And I'm designing a curriculum for that as well, because you know, this is what I do, so that people, as they go through it, are filling out this curriculum. At the end of it, they've got a business plan, they've got their goals, they've got their direction, and they've got you know, a rationale for why they're doing it. Fantastic. And that's happening in January as well. So there's tons of things happening. And in the midst of that, I'm going to start filming, um, or just after that, perhaps I'm going to film those soil courses. So expect that to be in the spring that I have that available or our spring, your fall. Yeah. Um, so that that's when that will be available. But the book is so rich that you could read it until then and have more to, to talk about and, and learn. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Fantastic. I think so. Um, I'm going to put down the links to all of these different things at, in the show notes because <laughs> there's so many things that you've just awesome. built off. Then I mean, you're prolific, absolutely prolific, and there's so so much that you that you're offering um, to the world, which is just you know it's such a it's such a gift. And I uh, thank you for for doing what you're doing. And you know, it's not just about you and keeping it. It is about you know everything that you're learning to be passing it on and to to sharing it out because you know like your bigger what what how would you describe your bigger picture about what you do like what you do and why you do it what how would how would you describe that i mean it probably sounds like grandiose right but i'm really trying to reshape the culture and the world so that my children can have children and grandchildren and on into the future in an ethical regenerative world that gets better because i grew up thinking the world was supposed to get better and better mm -hmm. like that's like like the every generation things get better and i don't i don't think that's wrong i think that's what nature is always doing it's always improving upon itself it's always reacting to what's there and making the best of what's there and yeah and and i just um i really really feel like We deserve, we really deserve better. We deserve so much better. I look at this and it hurts me because the kids in schools are my kids. I don't see a difference between my kids and those kids. I taught them, I subbed for them, I taught for years. And it hurts, you know what I mean? Knowing that like, yeah, because the situation we're in, it's going to suck bad for a lot of people. It's going to be deadly for even more. And it's like, we have to do better. And if we don't do better, how can we go to bed at night? Mm -hmm. And so maybe it's because this stuff, you know, at, 
attacks my, you know, uh, pricks my, my, my integrity or, 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 or maybe I, uh, it gives me anxiety or I don't know, but, um, I have to respond to it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm in, I'm in, uh, impelled to respond to it. Uh, so that's why I give away my books for free. The Permaculture Student One and Two on my website, thepermaculturestudent.com. Um, that's why I've got so many little free courses that, you know, share so much because it's, I feel like this is a human right. This becomes common sense if we do the right thing. We, we create stable cultures if we do the right thing. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I just, uh, that's why I'm doing it. That's where the energy comes from. It comes from the uh, connecting the, the, the greater need to my own personal need for my children to be okay. You know what I mean? Because they are connected. Mm -hmm. To think that they're not disconnected is insanity. Yeah. I mean, we live in a world that's showing us every day how closer and closer connected we are in a system that's showing stress, mm -hmm. which means in a system that's healthy, we have more and more connection along the same lines of healing, benefit, buffering, resilience. So, yeah. so yeah, I feel that's, that's, that's my why around that. And I, and I love the way you're talking about it. It's about working towards an, a new type of common sense because I think that's what I've always felt about permaculture. It is it just makes good common sense, and it but it it only makes common sense when you when you have that exposure to it, like you talked about before. And and I and I when you were talking about how you grew up with this sense that the world is getting you know gets better, I think that's I I also felt that, but there was this. There's this definition of what is better and what is progress and what is change. And, and so we've been heading on this development model, like this is what humans do. We develop, we improve. But what we need to shift that from the development model to the regenerative model so that it is, it's not really necessarily that much of a shift in consciousness in terms of like, well, we want to support, you know, our, our lives to get better than that, you know, but it has a different foundation. It has that that those ethics at the core of it. Earth care, people care, future care. So, you know, I think, you know, sometimes it it seems like I talk a lot about the ethics as well, and that maybe I spend too much time there. But but no, it is that is kind of the like what you're saying the, the foundation of of this deepening understanding or the 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 kind of the basis for a different type of communication to happen and a different type of pattern to emerge in all different realms of society. So, my gosh, we've been talking for an hour and a half. Maybe we should wrap it, wrap it up. It's been an, such an absolute delight to talk with you today on, on so many wine-ranging topics from you know, from from the soils to to the classrooms to the reasons why and ethics and all sorts of things in between. It's been such a rich conversation, and I just want to say thank you so much for the for your openness and in, in sharing and and the gift of your time today with us. And um, I really look forward to being able to share out your book to so many people, and I will let everyone know about um, our future world and. Um, and uh, soils course and all of these different things that you have available because you know it's a gift into the world um, and it helps everyone to understand how we can become more regenerative and and, and caring for the earth, earth and humanity I think it's it's wonderful thank you Matt thank you so much for having me I, I had a lot of fun So thanks for tuning in to the Sense Making in a Changing World podcast today. It's been a real pleasure to have your company. I invite you to subscribe and receive notification of each new weekly episode with more wonderful stories, ideas, inspiration and common sense for living and working regeneratively. And call positive permaculture thinking and design into action in this changing world. I'm including a transcript below and a link also to my four part permaculture series, really looking at what is permaculture and how to make it your livelihood too. So join me again in the next episode where we talk with another fascinating guest. I look forward to seeing you there.